Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy here in Washington, D.C., with the pleasure today of chatting with Daniel Hummel about his relatively new book on Christian dispensationalism, which has been a very powerful force in American evangelical and Protestant Christianity. Dan, good to talk with you. You too. Glad to be here. So starting out with just the basics, what is dispensationalism? Where did it come from? Right. So in a theological sense, uh, dispensationalism is a system of theology that's popular largely among conservative Protestants. Um, it's well known for its eschatology, its end time scenario that starts with an any moment rapture and culminates in a battle of Armageddon. And there's a lot of um, interesting plot points uh, in between those two things. Um, but it's also a whole system of theology. So the eschatology is part of a much broader system of theology. And uh, maybe the two other most important parts are a distinction between the church and Israel that dispensationalists make, meaning that um, as they read the Bible, God has a basically a plan of redemption through the nation, through the ancient ancient Israel, the nation of Israel, um, that remains in active now. Um, so the church did not replace Israel. That's been a common uh, teaching in church history. But Israel and the church are actually two chosen peoples of God, and that has an effect on how dispensationalists think about the role of the church in the world, as well as the role of Israel, particularly, particularly interest in the state of Israel today. And then finally, dispensationalism uh, is also a, a particular way of reading the Bible, a hermeneutic for reading the Bible. It's often called a, a, a plain reading or a literal reading of the Bible. But the, the key distinctive there is that dispensationalists tend to read the prophecy portions of the Bible, which is about a quarter of the entire Bible. They tend to take it as uh, a, they, they read it literally or, or alongside the way they read all the other parts of the Bible in a way that... Uh, prioritizes common sense readings or plain language readings. And that means that they tend to not like symbolism, allegory, spiritualization of the passages. And this feeds into the way they do their church Israel distinction and their view on prophecy. But it means that they talk about biblical passages differently than a lot of other Christians do. So that's the sort of theological system. It, the, the, the history of dispensationalism, largely at least the modern history, starts in the 1830s with the exclusive brethren, the Plymouth Brethren movement. John Nelson Darby is a key figure there. And it is through the, the transmission of those ideas from this dissenter group in Great Britain to the American scene in the late 19th century that then has this sort of improbable story of taking over um, a bunch of uh, the evangelical world by the mid 20th century. And uh, there's been there's a historian that is called dispensationalism the most um, persistent uh, popular theology in American history. And I think it has that, uh, it can have that claim. And so today we see it in um, some seminaries, some churches. We also see it in pop culture productions like the Left Behind novels that are inspired by the dispensationalist uh, theological system. Dan, I'm sorry, I didn't explain who you are, but you work at a Christian study center at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where you've been for five years. That's right. And I got my PhD in American history at UW-Madison. So I've been living here in Madison for more or less uh, a dozen years or so. And how did you become interested in dispensationalism? Well, I'm, I'm trained as an intellectual historian um, and uh, an historian of religion. And uh, so this is one area where... Um, these things meet is sort of a history of, of theological ideas. I also grew up uh, and still am an evangelical Christian, and I grew up in a dispensationalist family, uh, a family that um, sort of internalized and, and talked about these, these particular commitments I just talked about um, in our family, in our churches. I actually had, uh, for, for a while, I was living in Colorado Springs, Colorado as a kid, and we went to the same mega church as Jerry Jenkins, one of the co-authors of the Left Behind novels. So it's the world I grew up in. My dad got a master's degree from Dallas Theological Seminary, which is the most well-known, largest dispensationalist seminary. Um, so I've had a sort of personal interest, but also an intellectual interest in understanding where this tradition comes from and what effect it's had on American history. Now, it's occurred to me recently that with the Gaza war, with the war in Ukraine, with the war of China, uh, if this were 1985, there would be many, many evangelical uh, voices relating all of these events through a dispensationalist lens, that seems not to be the case. Is dispensationalism decreasing in influence in American Christianity? 
I think in certain ways it is. And I mean, my, my book is titled The Rise and Fall. So so I'm tipping my my hand even in the title. Um, there, there were a few uh, prominent pastors right after October 7th. Uh, October 7th happened on a Saturday. So there were actually some sermons on that Sunday that um, were about the prophetic significance of um, of what was happening, and and particularly there's some large megachurch type pastors who have gone that route. But I think what you're detecting is right, which is there's a much more fractured evangelical landscape when it comes to interpreting um, events in the Middle East. That does not mean, I, I would still say largely evangelicals support Israel, certainly polling says that. So it, it doesn't mean that um, the support is as fractured as the theological landscape, though it is um, it is eroding from maybe even from the 1980s. Um, but there's certainly um, different arguments being made for why evangelicals sh should support Israel, and many of them don't have anything to do with dispensational theology. So for example, Christianity Today's editor, Russell Moore, came out with an op-ed right after October 7th that I believe the title was something like, We Stand with Israel, or We Should Stand with Israel, very pro-Israel, had nothing to do with his view on prophecy or you know literal interpretations. He had a, a, a bunch of other arguments he was marshalling uh, for that, um, but, uh, but he aligns on that issue with dispensationalists who also support Israel, maybe the most prominent one being John Hagee, who's, uh, who leads, uh, founded and leads Christians Unite for Israel, which is a major lobby group um, in D.C. for sort of pro-Israel um, policies. So um, there, there are still really strong pockets, but, um, but it's much more fractured. And I would say, generationally, this is very true. So for evangelicals under the age of 40, um, we know from polling that there is just a, a massive drop in the theological commitments to dispensationalism that are, are leading to different views on the Middle East as well. And so there's a lot more ambivalence. There's either um, uh, sort of disinterest in the Middle East or a split among young evangelicals uh, about whether they side with the Palestinian perspective on the conflict or the Israeli perspective. That would have been very hard to predict. A generation ago. It, it seemed pretty lock solid that evangelicals, partly because of the theological background, but also because of the political commitments of uh, evangelical leaders, that um, that evangelicals were basically totally uh, on the side of Israel, or not totally, but majority on the side of Israel. That's really shifted, and it'll be interesting to see 20 years from now, um, or between now and 20 years from now, uh, exactly how that uh, difference in theological background and that difference in interest in the Middle East shapes the Christian Zionist world or the pro-Israel world uh, for evangelicals. But even among uh, young evangelicals who are theologically conservative and still pro-Israel, dispensationalism just doesn't resonate among them as it would have, say, among young evangelicals when I was young 35 years ago. Why did the influence recede so, uh, well, I would say quickly over the last 20 years, 25 years? Yeah, there, it's an interesting uh, uh, question. I, I try to offer at least one version of the narrative at the back end of, of my book. Um, one one big area is has been evangelical seminaries, and the seminary world has changed a lot in evangelicalism in the last 30 years to be far less hospitable to dispensationalist theologians and scholars. And some of that has been within non-dispensationalist evangelical seminaries, actually making it harder for dispensationalists to coexist in those. Others have been uh, dispensationalist colleges and seminaries actually getting rid of that theology, sort of divesting from that part of their religious tradition. And so this has a trickle-down effect. If the pastors aren't learning it, or if the you know, seminarians aren't learning it at seminary, then they're not going to teach it. Um, and and there has been a, a you could say, a, a, just a sea change in the, in the theological arguments. Um, that have really poked holes in traditional dispensationalist interpretations of Scripture, and at the same time have elevated non-dispensationalist readings of, for example, the book of Revelation, um, the rapture teaching. There's been a lot of really strong critiques of that from very prominent names like an N.T. Wright, uh, who's you know in the British world, but it has a large purchase among evangelicals, um, to uh, the dispensationalist longtime opponent within the fundamentalist world, which are the covenant theologians and that's represented by Westminster Theological Seminary today. Um, that that tradition, um, they've they've committed you know sustained resources and critiques on dispensationalism for a long time that have made it very hard to be intellectually respectable and a classic uh, classic dispensationalist, which is a term that we even have to use now because the dispensationalist world has also split among itself into a a couple different camps, um, and so there is a a more um, 
in, sort of intellectually interesting tradition called progressive dispensationalism. Progressive has nothing to do with politics. It's about the theology. Um, but uh, progressive dispensationalism and classic dispensationalism also argue with each other, also leading to a decline in the authority of the theological tradition as well. I recall a few years ago, a Methodist friend asked me what uh, John Wesley thought about the uh, the rapture. And I said, well, John Wesley wouldn't have understood the question because it wasn't really developed until, as you say, the early 19th century. But this is a common misunderstanding that dispensationalism has always been with us when it's really only a, a 200 year old movement. That's right. And um, you can definitely find precedents uh, before the 1830s, 1840s for certain parts of the dispensationalist theological system that go back earlier, including, you know, premillennialism is this bigger school of eschatology that um, you can you can justifiably categorize some of the church fathers as premillennialist if you define it in a certain way. But certainly the distinctive teachings of the rapture um, and, and of the certain way that uh, things are going to tran transpire after that, um, as well as the, um, the more literalist uh, reading of prophecy tied to um, tied to those beliefs. That's a 19th century, um, I, I would even argue, if I'm getting a little more um, uh, uh, aggressive in my argument, I would even argue it's, it's largely a 20th century uh, creation, at least the system of theology we call dispensationalism. Even in the 19th century, th these ideas were cohering, but they weren't, the, the term itself did not come about till the 1920s. So anybody before 1927, uh, when the when the term dispensationalism was coined, if you called them a dispensationalist, they they wouldn't necessarily know what you meant by that. For example, Schofield and the Schofield Reference Bible, which is often cited as one of the biggest promoters of dispensationalism. Um, Schofield died in 1921. He never called himself a dispensationalist. He never um, was called that. Um, uh, and yet he had many of the ideas. They weren't systematized in the same way. But that's all to say this is a very modern story. It's, it's something that really is about... Um, the 20th century in a lot of ways, uh, and about the, the history of theology in the American evangelical church. And the story is so powerful that it's probably accurate to say that the average American, even non-religious on the street, uh, knows what the rapture is, has heard sort of mockery of it on late night TV, or has some exposure to the Left Behind series. So uh, it's really entered the popular bloodstream over the last 30, 35 years. That's right. And um, uh, and maybe the left behind, you know, um, that that was a big, you know, novel series. Maybe that's wearing off. I mean, I, I doubt many kids today have read um, the left behind novels, but it's really kicked off in the 1970s in a really popular way with The Late Great Planet Earth, a book by Hal Lindsey. Um, it's a nonfiction book. It's a book that's trying to sort of popularize the dispensationalist understanding of the end times, looking at modern trends in the 1960s, mostly. Um, but that book was the best-selling nonfiction book in the United States in the 1970s. So it sold near 10 million copies in the decade. And so, yeah, a whole generation of people were familiarized with some of the key concepts of the eschatology through that. And it's 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 uh, diffused throughout the American culture now. We have uh, TV series based on the rapture. We have movies called Rapture Palooza and so forth. We have video games that use um, the device. Most Americans would assume, I think, that evangelicals believe in a literal antichrist dictator type figure that will require Christians to get a literal mark on their bodies, the mark of the beast. I mean, these are all sort of dispensationalist versions of these, you know, interpretations of, of of passages in the Bible that are very hard to interpret, um, but that's because the the dispensationalist version has really entered the mainstream of American culture, not in any coherent way, right? So many people know these things; they don't know the sort of traditional dispensationalist uh, reasoning for them, and they the, the, the way these things all fit together. But they know them because they've been popularized, and that's that was part of the strategy of dispensationalists, like the Left Behind authors, is they thought this was a great evangelistic tool if they could create a popularized version that this would bring the gospel to new people. People and um, and and you know win more people uh, for the kingdom and um, that might be the upside of that strategy. The downside is you have a basically uh, memified form of of eschatology that's traveling around and being invoked and made, being made fun of and so forth, uh, just like you mentioned. And this is a popular caricature from critics of conservative evangelicals. If they're pro-Israel, they're only pro-Israel because they see the Jewish people just as instruments for the end times, not because of any affection or regard for the Jewish people. So that narrative has been out there for a long time. 
Yes, that's been core. Uh, yeah, that's been core to criticisms of evangelical support of Israel. I mean, I, I spent. I, I wrote a book before this one on Christian Zionism. One of the main points of that book was to try to convey that that is that, that the the sort of prophetic interest in the nation of Israel is one of many many reasons why Christian why why evangelical Christians have supported Israel. And it's not even the most important one for the people who are at the center of the activist world in this on this topic. So the people who are building organizations, interacting with the Israeli government, sort of, you know, uh, fundraising, all that kind of stuff. If you get closer to those types of elite leaders, th they're less and less likely to be motivated by this caricature. There are, of course, many people um, who are motivated by those things. It's a very big country and and a lot of people are interested in the Middle East for prophetic reasons. But um, it, it was always a question to me of like, what is the practical significance of that type of interest? And my conclusion there and my conclusion is still is that that is not nearly as important as a lot of other reasons having to do with post-Holocaust theology, having to do with uh, interfaith dialogue, having to do with readings of the Bible around covenant um, and uh, and at, for some modern evangelicals, a, a reading of Genesis twelve three and this idea of God blessing those who bless Israel, all those things are as important as uh, eschatology for most uh, most of the leaders, actually, at least of of the pro Israel evangelical world today. I was told uh, the story accurate or not, and maybe someone will listen to this conversation and assure me that it's not accurate. But the president of the Assemblies of God was meeting with. Prime Minister Netanyahu many years ago, and the Israeli Prime Minister kept referring to his good friend John Hagee and how much he appreciated John Hagee. And finally, the President of the Assemblies of God said, who is this John Hagee you keep uh, referring to? So sometimes there's an assumption by Israelis that uh, the dispensationalist perspective is the dominant motivation for American Christians. Oh, I'm sure. And and uh, that wouldn't be totally off the mark in the sense that that there have been significant figures um, who have, you know, someone like Jerry Falwell Sr. Uh, was a dispensationalist and um, believed uh, and was was a pro very pro Israel. Um, I think it's interesting. That's one of the things in my first book I explored a lot was how do Israelis how have Israelis historically tried to understand the American evangelical world? And um, even into the like 2000s, they had the um they had reports that would be trying to identify the pope of the evangelical world and they would use that term pope as if it's interchangeable between different christian traditions and it was just a sign to me that even decades into a pretty deep relationship uh you know after the 80s after the 90s there was still just a very basic misunderstanding on the part of at least some israelis in government about how the evangelical world works in the us and that it is very disaggregated, very, um, you know, Byzantine in its structure, and that there is no such thing as a pope. The closest thing would be like a Billy Graham type, um, who really doesn't have much actual authority. He has a lot of sort of cultural authority, but Billy Graham never ran more than the Billy Graham Evangelical Association uh, to his name. And, you know, he he spoke for a certain slice of evangelicalism, but nothing more. And so um, there's, I think there's an assumption by many Israelis that all the evangelicals talk to each other and sort of get on the same page um, on these things. And and of course, it's 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 far from that. Even though many evangelicals would like it to be that way, um, it's a very diffuse, very um, uh, lots of centers of power, lots of uh, little subcultures within evangelicalism. That even within a Pentecostal world, you could have the Assemblies of God people and the John Hagee people um, that don't necessarily know each other that well. And so dispensationalism starts uh, with the, the Plymouth Brethren and John Darby in Britain in the early 19th century. It comes to America in the late 19th century, and it's popularized among whom? Uh, uh, it's popularized initially among uh, north, mostly northern uh, white evangelicals. So, so someone that's really important is Dwight Moody, um, the the you know most important revivalist of the late 19th century. And uh, I use the term Moody movement that I borrow it from uh, the historian Michael Hamilton. But basically, the way Billy Graham was the center of a whole network in the 20th century, Moody was the center of a whole network of people, institutions, um, uh, organizations in the late 19th century. And so the three main ways that these these teachings sort of enter the mainstream of American evangelicalism in the late 19th century are through the Bible conference movement, which is less important now, but was very important to the dissemination of ideas in the late 19th century, where you'd have conferences all around the country, often for weeks at a time in the summer, where people would learn how to read the Bible. Um, the founding of Bible institutes, which become basically modern-day Christian colleges, many of them are founded in the late 19th century by 
proto dispensationalists um, as mission training centers to get out the missions movement before the rapture. Um, and then the third main way is the global missions movement and the agencies that um, ran that movement. These are going to be non-denominational, uh, sort of uh, bottom-up uh, missions movements, but many of them become quite large, send missionaries all around the globe, inspire thousands of Americans to become missionaries, and most of them are founded by dispensationalists as well in the late 19th, early 20th century. So through these uh, institutional mechanisms, by the 1910s, 1920s, a big chunk of the American, the conservative Protestant evangelical world in a, in the United States is basically being um, upheld by these institutions that are deeply influenced by dispensationalism. And that's not to count all the churches that also teach this from the pulpit by that time as well. And so by the mid 20th century, these are mostly uh, Baptist and Pentecostals. Is that safe to say? Yep, Baptist, Pentecostal, uh, non-denominational, that, that becomes more important um, the, the further into the story you go. Um, interestingly enough, earlier on, there was a lot of um, Presbyterian and, uh, believe it or not, Episcopalian uh, adoption of uh, proto-dispensationalist ideas in the early 20th century. Um, uh, Congregationalists are another one. Dwight Moody was a Congregationalist. Cyrus Schofield was a Congregationalist as well. Um, I think the appeal is to a lower church um, congregationalist uh, type uh, setting. That's where dispensationalism made more inroads than not. And that somewhat aligns with the lineage from the dissenter brethren movement, which was also, you know, quite uh, sectarian in its outlook and, and you could say low church in its understanding of the sacraments uh, and, and otherwise. And so that's, those are the types of traditions that end up embracing it. And it makes inroads in the Southern Baptist Convention um, as well, but is, is most powerful in the Baptist world and the independent Baptist movements that um, are, are really important, not just in the South, but in the North. Here in Wisconsin, there's a couple actual uh, colleges that are are founded by independent Baptists that continue to teach dispensationalism um, at a small scale. And, and that's an important part of the story as well. And um, the reformed world was always, you mentioned Presbyterians, but largely the reformed world has been very resistant to dispensationalism, hasn't it? By the, by the 1930s, uh, this is, this is, Yes, it, th that's where the covenant theology um, tradition is strongest, or one of the places is the Presbyterian world. And so you by the 1930s, you really get this clean, or it's not clean, but this very stark division within the fundamentalist movement between the dispensationalists and the covenantalists. And my argument in the book is that a lot of the institution building in the mid-20th mid century in evangelicalism, at least in this part of evangelicalism, is about this conflict between the dispensationalists and the covenantalists. So both of them are building seminaries creating magazines, peer-reviewed journals, mission agencies to promote their theological tradition against the other one, both vying for sort of the heart of the fundamentalist movement. And um, and and so the 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 Presbyterian, the, the the more reformed tradition, the Dutch reformed tradition, are very opposed to dispensationalism. They see it as a modern heresy, more or less. The the term is coined by one of those, by a Presbyterian named Philip Morrow, who rejects dispensationalism as a modern heresy. And so this is a very vicious, uh, vicious in a uh, conceptual sense, not in a physical sense, a <laughs> battle uh, between these two uh, sub-traditions within the conservative Protestant world that um, ends up, you know, shaping a lot of the seminary and church world through the rest of the century. Billy Graham was a moderate dispensationalist. He grew up one. Um, he was deeply influenced by it. And over time, he he peeled back more and more of his dispensationalism. And part of the way you can track this is who he you know hung out with, basically. And by the 1950s, uh, Billy Graham was the you know, the poster boy for the neo-evangelical movement, which was this revival of evangelicalism started in the 1940s. Uh, a lot of the institutions we have today, Christianity Today, Fuller Seminary, National Association of Evangelicals come out of that movement. That movement was largely anti-dispensationalist. It saw dispensationalism as one of the anti-intellectual parts of the fundamentalist world that needed to be gotten rid of. So Graham's favorite theologian was Carl Henry, who was the first editor of Christianity Today. Carl Henry was very opposed to dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. um, Harold Ockengay was the um, uh, first president of Fuller. Um, Ockengay was opposed to dispensationalism. And then Fuller's sort of biggest star as a theologian or a New Testament scholar was George Eldon Ladd, whose major uh, scholarly contributions were to uh, 
right against dispensationalism. This is in the 1950s and 1960s. And so these are who Graham really championed and, and Graham saw as um, having basically the right view on things. That being said, Graham is one of these figures like Dwight Moody in the late 19th century who had the uncanny ability to be friends with a lot of people that he disagreed with. And so many dispensationalists worked for Graham, uh, worked it for Graham's causes because they saw him as a, a force for good, a magnetic personality. And Graham valued these people a lot as well. But over time, Graham uh, increasingly distanced himself from um, the the dispensationalist theological uh, discussions. And he did write in the 80s, he, write a book, he wrote a book called The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, I believe, which on the face of it would make you think, oh boy, this is going to be a, a very dispensationalist book. But if you actually read it, it's not dispensationalist. He's using that actually in a symbolic way to talk about the big challenges to America in the 1980s. And there is some biblical eschatology in there, but it is not uh, traditional dispensationalism at all. So um, he, he's you know, he has that ability to use uh, uh, sort of words or phrases that would indicate a, a certain position, but also load that term with something that's a little different, uh, not necessarily more liberal or anything. I mean, Graham never uh, saw himself in that way, but just a different theological tradition than the one he grew up with and then the dispensationalist one that is often associated with um, apocalyptic terms. And Francis Schaeffer was a huge uh, intellectual influence on many evangelicals in the 1970s, uh, 1980s, and he obviously, as a Presbyterian, would never have been dispensationalist. He was not. Uh, he had an interesting, uh, very you know, uh, colorful history in the fundamentalist movement, and so he was associated with um, Carl McIntyre, who was a very sort of prominent fundamentalist uh, leader in the 19. 40s and 50, well, McIntyre was around for a long time, but particularly with Schaefer, 1940s and 50s. And there is a dispensationalist influence on McIntyre, though it's not, uh, it's, it's heterodox, not orthodox. But Schaefer was very skeptical in the 70s uh, of the pop dispensationalism that was um, around because of the Hal Lindsey, Lake Ray Planet Earth phenomenon. He found that to be pretty shallow thinking and pretty problematic for integrating it into a deeper reformed theological system, which is where Schaefer really um, you know, really specialized. And so um, he rejected the any moment rapture idea. Um, and uh, he did talk about the rapture. I mean, it, this is, it's just, it was part of the time, but he talked about the rapture. He had a different view of the rapture than the any moment rapture. Um, and he rejected the church Israel distinction that is at the core of dispensationalism. And so um, Schaefer is another person who many dispensationalists were inspired by Schaefer, read his stuff, liked him. I'm sure he liked them to some extent. He and Jerry Falwell teamed up in the late 70s on pro-life issues, among other things. And so those that, there's an example of him working across those theological divides. Um, but ultimately, Schaefer uh, saw, he also, by the way, saw dispensationalists as valuable allies on the biblical inerrancy debate which is something that was near and dear to Schaefer's heart in, in his last years. And dispensationalists, if nothing else, are strong proponents of a robust view of biblical inerrancy. And so he saw them as, as uh, allies on, on that front, but ultimately disagreed with a lot of their conclusions when it came to eschatology and other issues. And obviously with their strong focus on the end times, dispensationalism was prone towards uh, an apocalyptic perspective uh, in its social and political attitudes, which is now receded, and it almost seems like uh, evangelical Christian social witness has become, if not explicitly, almost more post-millennial in its perspective about working to change the world here and now. Is that another reflection of the decline and fall of dispensationalism? That's how I'm reading it. Yeah. So uh, on multiple fronts, um, the you could say the energy in conservative evangelical political activism is is not with dispensationalists, but with these post-millennial traditions. So one important one being a more reformed post-millennialism. Um, the person who's well known in that front right now is a Doug Wilson type in Moscow, Idaho. Um, he represents a lot of um, you know, other people who think in this in the same way, which is this strong sense that um, Christians are called to uh, lead the country and and should engage with politics, and ultimately that this will usher in, in some way, the kingdom of God. Uh, this is something that dispensationalists would totally reject and uh, would say the only person that can do that is Jesus through the second coming. The other uh, big uh, post-millennial tradition is the more charismatic uh post-millennialism that is also quite popular. Many of the people, many of the evangelical leaders who have been really vocal proponents of Donald Trump's presidency back 
uh, a few years ago and for his candidacy this year come out of that tradition, including his, uh, I, I believe she's often called his personal spiritual advisor, but Paula White. Um, she comes out of this charismatic um, post-millennial tradition. Another figure in that world is Lance Wallnau, who's known in part for promoting the seven mountains uh, theory, which is this idea that evangelicals are called to assume the seven mountains of culture, basically, which are business, media, and so forth. Um, and this, this is just totally foreign to a dispensationalist understanding of what the church's role in the world is, which for dispensationalists is largely to support Israel and to evangelize. And anything else is a detraction or, or a, a, a um, uh, dissolving of the core call of the church. Um, and so they see no role for evangelicals to try to, you know, assume the heights of business or, or media um, or government. Um, they might support that as a, a way to protect themselves, and that was the pitch made in the 70s and 80s by people like Jerry Falwell. Um, but the vision was not to take over culture and somehow that being the way Jesus uh, will redeem the world. Um, but but the post-millennial vision is that. And so, yeah, a lot of the energy in the evangelical political world is on those fronts and, and less so on the dispensationalist front. Daniel Hummel, author of the rise and fall of dispensationalism, how the evangelical battle over the end times shaped a nation. Thank you very much for a fascinating conversation. It's been a pleasure.